Conservatives would make abortion punishable by execution, but they don't yet think they can get away with that. So they just exacerbate the conditions that lead to the deaths of people getting abortions. This is very true. They are very well aware that back alley abortions can lead to the harm and death of the people engaging in them. And if you make things illegal, people will go through back alley channels, unregulated channels, in order to get the thing that's being prohibited. You see this with the opioid crisis, people overdosing on fentanyl because they're getting unregulated drugs. And this is true. Conservatives would make the crime, quote unquote, of abortion punishable by the death penalty if they could, but they understand that they do not have the political capital yet to do it. So instead, they make conditions so bad for people who would seek to get an abortion so that those people end up essentially getting condemned to death without them actually putting it on the books that that's the result. Because we live in hell, because conservatives hate you and want you to suffer as much as possible for literally no reason, the Supreme Court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade, contradicting the opinions of the broader public who want continued access to legal and safe abortions, who wanted to keep Roe v. Wade in place, we'll look at the stats in that in a moment, and also literally only did this to appeal to the political ambitions of the right wing of this country. The Supreme Court as it exists currently, and a variety of courts at all levels, has been flooded with and packed with a variety of activist conservative judges who wish to legislate from the bench. Because Republicans understand that conservatism is not popular and they cannot garner large public support for it, uh, well, they have to do things like gerrymander in red states, as well as employ a variety of voter suppression measures to make sure that the least amount of people that is possible can vote. They understand that historically when voter turnout is high, Democrats tend to win, and when voter turnout is low, Republicans tend to win. Because they know that they have an inherently unpopular ideology, democracy is not very good for them. It does not really work out too well. So they have been doing a variety of things to undo that democracy. January 6th was just one small piece of the puzzle, like I just mentioned, the gerrymandering and whatever else, which are already inherently anti-democratic. Uh, we also now see, because of the January 6th committee, that Donald Trump, the then president, was conspiring with a variety of members of his administration in order to over overturn the legitimate election of 2020 and unseat then president-elect Joe Biden and remain in power. Luckily though, before his coup attempt was eventually unsuccessful, he was able to appoint three judges, Gorsuch, Barrett, and Kavanaugh, all of which voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. Kind of curious that we as a country somehow, some way, expect the court, the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, to have some air of legitimacy when three of the people that voted for this unpopular decision that contradicts the will of the people were appointed by a allegedly seditious administration that was actively working against the will of the people in the 2020 election. It's almost like those judges should not be seen as legitimate as a result of that. But we'll get into that as well. So, of course, Clarence Thomas did cite in his concurrence, where is it? There we go. That, uh, quote, in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. So Aaron Reed says, terrifying. In the wake of Roe v. Wade, Thomas's concurrence says that the Supreme Court now needs to revisit laws protecting contraception and same-sex relationships. This is all the same fight. Anti-trans laws, anti-LGBTQ laws, abortion, we must fight for each other's rights. And that's true. So Obergefell was the 2015 Supreme Court decision that made gay legal, legalized gay marriage. That is potentially on the chopping block now. Now. Griswold and Lawrence, I forget which, but one of these was for anti-sodomy laws, making anti-sodomy laws illegal federally, and the other one was contraception. Griswold is contraceptives, thank you. So all of these have the precedent of right to privacy. Roe v. Wade was put into place on the basis of a right to privacy. Now you may have noticed that the Supreme Court has also ruled that you cannot sue police officers anymore if they do not deliver to you your Miranda rights when you're being arrested. In the wake of this very unpopular position, that contradicts the will of the people, that decision on Miranda rights, suspiciously timed, when they knew that there would be civil unrest on the basis of their going against the people's will. So if you look at this Pew Research Center, data collection, U.S. public continues to favor legal abortion and oppose overturning Roe v. Wade. I'm gonna turn my dark reader on here because goddamn, I'm getting flashbanged. 
Majority continues to say abortion should be legal in all or most cases. So percent who say abortion should be, this is from 1995 to 2019, legal in all slash most cases has oscillated a little bit, but it's about 61% now. Illegal in all or most cases, 38%. So a good majority of the American people polled think that abortion should remain legal in all or most cases. Also, in the specific context of Roe v. Wade, broad public opposition to completely overturning Roe v. Wade, would you like to see the Supreme Court completely overturn its Roe v. Wade decision or not? By percentage, so this is from 1992 to 2019, no, do not overturn Roe v. Wade in 2019 is at 70%. Yes, overturn Roe v. Wade is at 28%. A grand majority of people polled, and this is bipartisan as well, say that Roe v. Wade should not be overturned. And yet it's happened anyway. The reason why is because, like I said before, the Supreme Court has been flooded with a bunch of conservative activist judges. They want to legislate from the bench because they cannot get their legislation passed or at least they think they can't. And even if they thought they could, they would do this anyway because they don't like democracy. Conservatives don't like democracy. And it's evident in the way that they talk about a variety of issues pertaining to it. So if you talk about people like Amy Coney Barrett, one of the big things about her confirmation hearings is that she called herself a textualist, uh, which can also be called an originalist. And there might be some differences there. But essentially, the idea is that when they go and interpret the Constitution, they interpret it as it was written when it was written. Right? So obviously, we all know that the Founding Fathers literally structured the Constitution to be able to be amended because they understood that the conditions of the time might change into the future and the Constitution of the time might not be totally relevant and new things might need to be added or subtracted. Uh, but this diluted worldview essentially means that, oh, well, it's the text of the Constitution is how I'm going to interpret it. And I'm not going to bring any context of the modern day into it at all because I'm fucking stupid. So I wrote on Twitter, constitutional originalists, quote unquote, are exactly what the name suggests. They want to return this country back to its founding. That's so when I talk about inherently democratic, Republicans, conservatives don't like democracy. They don't like the will of the people being represented. They want to return this country back to its founding. So when this country was founded, this is what it was founded on. These were the conditions of the day that luckily we've been able to amend over time as time has changed. Back when women were property, when black people were property, when poor people were serfs, where queer people were literally just killed, and where wealthy white men ruled. So all poor people were serfs. You had no rights whatsoever when it came to your labor. What's sad is that we've never even come close to achieving freedom or equality for any of the aforementioned groups, and we won't until we excise conservatism from this country like the malignant tumor that it is. This caustic ideology needs to be made politically irrelevant, and that's the only way that our human project can survive. Like, forget the American project, the human project. Climate change is a looming existential threat that does not give a fuck about your feelings and doesn't care about your party affiliation. It's going to fuck you eventually if you don't do something about it, and the Republicans and conservatives don't want to do anything about it for a variety of reasons. The human race cannot survive conservatism. It is not possible. To be a Republican or conservative is antithetical to the survival and continued prosperity of the human race. The fight for equality between black, brown, women, birthing, queer, poor people, it's all interconnected, and without the liberation of all, we will have the liberation of none. If one group gets quote-unquote freedom, the subjugation of other groups will be used as precedent to undo it. And we see this when it comes to Griswold, when it comes to Obergefell, loving, for instance, that allowed for interracial marriage. All of these decisions are now possible to be undone using the precedent of the now return to the subjugation of women. So, of course, I've talked about this before on my channel many times over, but I will once again bring it up because it is evergreen. This video, Defend Trans People or the Right Comes for You Next, which is where I talk about the so-called right-wing civil rights ladder dilemma. Here's a handy little infographic that I have devised in order for this idea to work out. Now, it does need to be amended. It's a bit old. I figure I just will do that now. Why not? At the founding of this country... We had a patriarchal white supremacist state, like I suggested before. Women were the property of their husband and fathers. They had no rights. They could not vote. They could not work. They couldn't do anything without the permission of their husbands or fathers. And black and brown people were subjugated. Queer people were just killed. And on and on and on. That's the foundation of this country. 
ever since then because of a variety of civil rights fights. Fortunately, we've been able to secure some amounts of civil rights for the individual liberty and bodily autonomy of the aforementioned groups. Uh, but that's unfortunate for the right wing generally, for conservatives, for Republicans, because to be a conservative definitionally means you want to maintain the status quo. Now, it's a bit of a tricky definition, though, because that doesn't just mean maintaining the status quo of the modern day. So, for instance, you could be a conservative as it pertains to the modern day in that to maintain the status quo would be to maintain Obergefell, the right to gay marriage, to maintain Roe v. Wade, the right to an abortion. But this version of it wants to return to the status quo of the way, way past, back when there was a patriarchal white supremacist state, the foundation of this country. So... I made this little graphic back when we were focusing a lot on the trans-related legislation, bills, and moral panic being passed, which is still ongoing, mind you. So that's why it says you are here. But anyway, the, essentially the take is this. If the right wing is able to get legislation on paper about op the oppression of trans people like bathroom bills, like making HRT and gender related healthcare inaccessible, et cetera, et cetera. If they're able to get those solidified into legislation, well, then they can maintain their hold on this rung of the ladder and then start to try to repair the next rung, which has only been broken, not removed, right? Now, the reason why this has to be amended a little bit is because, at least with this overturn of Roe v. Wade, they've actually solidified this rung again. The attack on women, and we will include all birthing people because we're wokists or whatever. So, we're actually here now, which is kind of distressing. Now, like I say, all of these different uh, rungs can be interchangeable and moved around. The positioning of them is pretty contextual, and you can skip steps like we have here, but Roe v. Wade broke that rung, the subjugation of women rung, but now it's been repaired a little bit. Maybe not fully, but repaired a little bit. Perhaps to fully repair it would have to undo suffrage for women or something, and make them not allowed to work, or whatever. But now, things are a little bit scarier, because now they could very easily repair the gay rung by overturning Obergefell, and on and on and on. So you might think, like, well, why is this ladder here to begin with? What the, why, how about we just get rid of the ladder? Well, that's the only way, right? The only way we can actually win and achieve equality and liberation for all people is to get rid of the ladder entirely. To not only break these rungs, but to get rid of them so that they can't possibly climb back up and then they just remain here burning in hell, which they're going to go if it exists. It's a bit unfortunate, and I've been talking about it for a while, uh, but that's essentially the take. Now, a common retort that you will see from well-meaning people, and this argument should be made because it's good for people on the fringes, uh, on the fence, etc., etc., is something like what AOC is saying here. AOC says, Overturning Roe and outlawing abortions will never make them go away. It only makes them more dangerous, especially for the poor and marginalized. People will die because of this decision. We will never stop until abortion rights are restored in the United States of America. So many people will bring up the overturn of Roe v. Wade and any laws that make abortion illegal doesn't stop abortions from happening. They just stop safe abortions from happening. Uh, but the thing about that is, is that Republicans know that. Conservatives know that. But they don't care. I replied saying conservatives would make abortion punishable by execution, but they don't yet think they can get away with that. So they just exacerbate the conditions that lead to the deaths of people getting abortions. This is very true. They are very well aware that back alley abortions can lead to the harm and death of the people engaging in them. And if you make things illegal, people will go through back alley channels, unregulated channels, in order to get the thing that's being prohibited. You saw this in prohibition of alcohol, for instance. You see this with the opioid crisis, people overdosing on fentanyl because they're getting unregulated drugs. And this is true. Conservatives would make the crime, quote unquote, of abortion punishable by the death penalty if they could, but they understand that they do not have the political capital yet to do it. So instead, they make conditions so bad for people who would seek to get an abortion so that those people end up essentially getting condemned to death without them actually putting it on the books that that's the result right? This is the same for trans healthcare and affirming parents, by the way. So what I've talked a lot about in the recent trans discourse that we've had, affirming parents and access to gender-related healthcare make rates of depression and attempted suicide in trans people drop dramatically, like insanely so. And it can seem like a good argument against conservatives to be like, well, actually, 
Studies suggest that parents being affirming of their child's gender identity and access to gender-related health care makes trans people in general less likely to be depressed and kill themselves. The conservative, the right wing, the Republican response to that is I don't care. Because if they had their way, if they had the political capital in order to just say this, their position would be that the crime of being trans would be punishable by death. The death penalty would be the punishment for that. But they know they can't, so instead they exacerbate the conditions that lead to trans people taking their own lives or being victims of hate crimes. So while I do think it's still an argument that you should make, and I think it can be convincing to people on the fence, on the fringes, it's never going to convince a Republican. It's never going to convince a conservative, and you should not waste your time trying to convince them. But when you argue with them, hopefully people in the periphery end up being receptive to your arguments and move more toward your side. Um, but if this kind of logic, this kind of facts, these studies, this data was enough to move the opinions of conservatives, then they wouldn't be conservatives anymore. Because conservative ideology, the policies they support, and the things they talk about are routinely contradicted by the actual facts, logic, studies, and data on the matter. If they actually cared about that shit, they wouldn't be conservatives anymore. But obviously they don't about that shit because their ideology is inherently irrational. So as I mentioned before, three of the judges in this 6-3 decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, were all appointed by Donald Trump. And his administration, as the January 6th commission has very clearly shown us, his administration was conspiring to subvert the will of the people and overturn the 2020 presidential election. Also, all of them lied under oath about Roe. When asked about the precedent of Roe v. Wade, all of these Supreme Court justices said that it was settled precedent and that it would be foolish to even suggest overturning it. And yet here we are. So, as such, their replacement is literally an act of self-preservation for our democracy and our country. How can we possibly trust the justices on the highest court of the land to fulfill the will of the people, to actually bring justice for the people, if they were appointed by an administration that was actively working to subvert it? In my view, all of these judges, and all judges of every level of government, not just the Supreme Court, are illegitimate and should be replaced. They should be replaced. They should be impeached, and nominations should be made to replace them. We cannot trust that our democracy, the next time a presidential election rolls around, will be able to sustain them. We don't know. And that level of unknown is just not conducive to the continued survival of the American project. I'm sorry, it's just not. So the idea that they're able to make these blanket decisions that literally subvert a bipartisan consensus on the issue, it's, it's not looking good, folks. So unfortunately, the response from the Democrats to all this is limp dick, do nothing, mamby pamby bullshit that helps nobody. Shocking really uh so joe biden came out said some stupid shit about oh no matter how deeply you care about the decision keep all protest people jack don't do anything i wouldn't do don't be violent shut the fuck up stupid bitch the oppression of a marginalized group as it pertains to women and birthing people as it pertains to trans people as it pertains to black and brown people as it pertains to poor people necessarily requires violence the state does violence to those it seeks to oppress necessarily inherently definitionally and as such the proportional response to that violence being enacted onto the self is self-defense which unfortunately includes violence there's no way to get around that you can't get around that if i'm getting stabbed and i have the means to defend myself using violence and survive that altercation i'm going to do that for my own self-preservation to suggest otherwise is foolish but of course, they're Democrats. Of course, it's Joe Biden. It's Joe Brandon. So he has to say shit like this, even though he probably also believes it. Uh, but essentially, if you don't want people to react violently to decisions like this, if you don't want people to react violently to the violence subjected to them on the basis of their own oppression, then don't oppress them. Easy fix. Ensure equality for all marginalized people. For all people. And then why would people react violently if there's nothing to react violently to? Gets the noggin jogging. Really activates my almonds.
Also, Nancy Pelosi uh, is immediately fundraising off of this. Surprise, surprise. The Democrats were singing God Bless America on the steps of the Supreme Court of the Capitol or some stupid bullshit like that. The Democrat response has not been that great, except for some of the more progressive members of the caucus, like Bernie Sanders, AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Pramila Jayapal, Jamal Bowman, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but generally speaking, not much has been done. Uh, in order, in, in terms of the things that they could do, uh, you could just nominate more Supreme Court justices. There is no reason why the Supreme Court should be limited to nine judges. There is no law on the books that says that the Supreme Court should have nine justices. In fact, it's had more than nine justices in the past. Apparently, the Supreme Court was supposed to have one justice per one circuit. And currently, there are 13 circuits. So theoretically, we could have 13 justices. But anyway, you could move to abolish the filibuster and attempt to codify Roe into law, which is unfortunately not the best idea because it could just get overturned again in the Supreme Court. But it's another thing you could attempt to do. You could also abolish the Supreme Court altogether, but I don't think they'll do that. Anyway... <laughs> In my view, the Supreme Court is an inherently undemocratic institution. The Supreme Court justices that overturned Roe v. Wade, the majority of them were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote, who only won because of the participation trophy that is the Electoral College, which is a fundamentally undemocratic mechanism that was literally put in place to appease slave owners. So the idea that they're put there through some kind of democratic process is absurd. Ideally, on paper, the people would elect representatives which would then nominate these justices and in that way you'd have some kind of winding path of democracy, but that's not how it is. And to suggest that it is is naive, foolish, and frankly, counterfactual. In my view, it has no legitimacy. They, they just happen to act as, you know, high priests, unironically, like they are theocratic conservative activist judges who are making decisions not based on any actual interpretation of the constitution but rather their political aims it's very clear oh this was a very interesting tweet that i liked a lot so a lot of people are pointing to i believe ecuador there are currently protests going on i think and also when it came to mexico trying to make abortion illegal there was a lot of militant protests as a result of that and then later on abortion rights were enshrined into law so this person, Gaby, Gabby, DBJ, says, I genuinely believe U.S. libs' uselessness is the result of most Americans' insulation from overt political violence. The reason Latin American leftists are so militant is because they know their political enemies want them dead. So they respond accordingly. That understanding is absent here. So in a lot of what I've talked about is reciprocated in this tweet. It is very true that in my father's home country of Honduras, there are factions there that will literally just kill people for their political gain. Happens a lot. In fact, America has a bit of a part to play in that as well, funnily enough. They understand that the right wing gaining power in these countries is literally an existential threat for them and their families. They could literally die at the hands of these people. Now, that's what's so convenient about the right wing in this country, understanding that they don't have the current political capital to just make the punishment for getting an abortion the death penalty. They can't currently just say people who get abortion should be put to death. So instead they exacerbate conditions that lead to their death. And in that way, you kind of make the punishment death, but just not overtly. However, in other countries like, say, Saudi Arabia, people will be put to death for a variety of crimes, and conservatives in this country are a bit jealous about that. That's why whenever they bring up Saudi Arabia, like, oh my god, you think you have a bad here? Well, in Saudi Arabia, they stone people for being gay. They're jealous. Conservatives are jealous that Saudi Arabia has, one, become and is a theocratic authoritarian state, because that's what they want here, and two, stones gay people in the public square. They're jealous. They want that, but they know they can't do it. The reason why a lot of libs in this country are hesitant to do militant, radical self-defense action is because they aren't in direct peril like people in Latin America are. People in Latin America will raise hell because they understand that their lives could be at threat. Whereas the implicit violence, the implicit threat to the lives of people in America allows for people to be a little bit more, you know, cozy, comfy, and it massages them a little bit to the point where they're still dying, just not overtly by decree of the state. Me being from Argentina, yeah, I totally agree. Things socially are not so good in here. I wish more people would get up to go against a lot of the bullshit that goes on. You are right. I agree with your sentiment. Hell yeah. I've done a lot of research into my father's home country and nurse, and a lot of crazy shit's gone on there. And people are very militant there as well, uh, and have been historically all over Latin America. Uh, you know, the libs in the U.S. are just a little bit more comfortable.
So I suppose now we should move on to what do we do about this whole conundrum? Because the outlook is bleak and the future is a fuck. So just because I have it on hand, here's AOC saying that voting is critical, but alone it's not enough. So luckily, you know, AOC, one of the shit libs, as it were, seems to understand that voting is important, but it's not the be all end all of civic engagement. She goes on to say we need to organize, strike, fill coffers of abortion funds, open our homes to help those seeking safe passage and more to establish and defend our rights. People have more power than they realize it's time we rediscover it and this is true so in my view and this has always been my view voting is the bare minimum civic engagement that you should engage in voting is the bare minimum so there will be a lot of people on the left that'll be like oh you know the liberals they just they gotta vote harder you gotta vote harder that's always the response you just have to vote harder and that is a liberal position because for some reason a lot of libs don't know how to do things outside of the electoral system however the leftist position is vote and if voting is, in my view, the bare minimum political engagement, you should be doing more if you can. So it is true, before any of the super lefties in my community get mad at me, voting isn't always easy. I understand that. Gerrymandering, voter suppression, all of these things exist. People having to work multiple jobs to make ends meet that don't have time to take off to vote because voting day is not a national holiday. I understand that it's not always easy to vote, which is why I say if it is easy for you to vote, you should. And when it comes to who you vote for, you're going to have to vote for the best option in the primary, the Democratic primary. And then the least bad option in the general, which unfortunately is the Democrats. Because of the first past the post voting system, and until we move to a proportional voting system, the Democrats are the only other party that have a mathematically feasible chance of winning. Unfortunately, as much as I would like them to, third parties don't until we can move past first past the post. So the Democratic Party is very well aware that they have us locked in this abusive relationship. Right? So we have to, unfortunately, for now, engage with this abusive relationship and vote for the least bad option in the general. However, in the primary, you should vote for, and if you want to, and have the time to, campaign for the best option. In my view, a hostile takeover of the Democratic Party is one method, in tandem with a variety of others, which I haven't even got to yet, to be able to exert institutional power for the liberation of marginalized people. The Justice Democrats are an attempt to do this. CSA endorsed candidates are a way to do this and they can be successful and have been a, a bit successful depending on where you're at, especially locally. When you go to vote, you're not just voting for the president. You're not just voting for your senator. You're voting down ballot. You're voting for potentially your senator, the district house representative that you're in, potentially voting for the governor, the mayor, depending on what year it is you're voting for, a variety of lower ranking positions, and you should look into who those people are and support the best option. The right wing is very aware of this. The far right has actively infiltrated and pushed a variety of fucking lunatics into local politics. And local politicians actually have a fairly large amount of power in their local jurisdiction. The left needs to do this too. So that's just one, okay? Now, unfortunately, because the Supreme Court is an inherently undemocratic institution, the president at the time gets to nominate a Supreme Court justice, and then they're there for life. Lifetime appointment. Uh, so having a Democrat as the president, whenever one of those octogenarian old fucks ends up expiring, is better than a Republican. Because if we did have a Democrat in power at those times, well then, Roe v. Wade would probably not be being overturned right now, because we'd have a liberal majority Supreme Court. Additionally, we can do things outside of the electoral system. Isn't that crazy? That's the and part of the vote and position. The and part is that you should be, if you can, doing a variety of direct action, community organizing, and building of dual power more often than you vote. Voting day only comes around every now and again. However, the rest of the 365 days of the year, if you are able, you have opportunities to do those things that you suggest people should do instead of voting. So these things can include a variety of potential actions like literally just getting to know your neighbors, talk to your neighbors, go to local community events. Like if there's a community finger painting thing, go there, talk to people, get to know people. Very simple very chill. Additionally, maybe set up a local free library if you can. Free public library. Maybe try to set up, you know, a, a community garden. Any kind of very chill, very vibey local community organizing you can do to get people to get to know each other. Very helpful for solidarity down the line. 
As well, most people spend the majority of their lives at their job. I did for 10 years. Unionize your workplace if you can. We've seen a lot of very hopeful stuff in regards to the Starbucks unions. Very many people have been able to engage with their co-workers and unionize their Starbucks workplaces. I think over 150 Starbucks locations have been unionized. We have the Amazon Labor Union as well. The plus side to that is that for one, it allows you to further connect to your community because if you're in a union and you're fighting with your coworkers, that is a more intimate bond than you had previously. As well, you are able to bargain for not only better wages and better working conditions, but let's say that the energy sector, this sector literally makes the country run. Now, what if there's a lot of women and people who can give birth that work in this energy industry and they don't like that Roe v. Wade is being overturned? Well, if they were unionized, because even the men, even the people who can't give birth in those locations care about the well-being of their co-workers who they work with, as well as their family members who are subjected to the overturn of Roe v. Wade, they can work together to literally grind the country to a halt through work stoppages. You could just stop working until action is taken to secure the civil rights of women and people who can give birth, as one example. Or even like simple shit like Starbucks even. Like, so for instance, if Starbucks is funding anti-LGBTQ politicians and you don't like that because you definitely have, especially if you're at Starbucks, LGBT coworkers, well, you could do work stoppages to influence Starbucks, if you have enough of a critical mass to hurt their bottom line, to stop funding anti-queer politicians. There's a variety of ways you can do this, uh, and it's very, very helpful. One of the reasons why people feel so helpless in this moment is because we do not have that level of organization. So if you had a local community you could turn to, if you had a union and your coworkers you could turn to, if you had the option of doing these actions, you wouldn't feel as hopeless as you do. There are many reasons why we don't have this. For one, Republicans and some Democrats have consistently gutted people's right to unionize in their workplace, to organize in their workplace. Not only that, the infrastructure of this country makes community organizing harder. Because this country's infrastructure in its major urban centers and even outside of them are more so built to be car dependent, so you need a car to get anywhere, well, it's kind of hard to walk down to like your local urban center and do a, a protest or do an action. You have to drive there and you have to find parking or you have to find somebody to drive you. And it makes you a lot more alienated. It's harder to get to these large urban centers where you can get to know people in your community if you need a car to get there and you don't have the money to get one or if you're too young to drive. Infrastructure is actually incredibly important to the aims of a leftist future. And not only that, but it helps people who aren't leftists. In addition to this, you should absolutely be participating in protests. You should be going out there making your voice heard, not giving the people trying to strip you of your individual liberties, of your civil rights, an ounce of rest. They don't deserve it. They are subverting the will of the people for no benefit, except for their own political ambitions. You should absolutely, if you have the means, giving money to a variety of places like abortion funds, which help people not only get abortions, but pay for the travel of people to go to places where they can. There's a variety of things you can do in that regard. I say all this to say that the leftist project is multifaceted. Electoralism is absolutely and will never be the be all end all of civic engagement. It's not the only thing that people should do. In fact, it's one of the least important, but it's still important and you still need to engage in it. And in tandem with that, you need to do the on the ground organizing the militancy that you're doing. I feel like we could probably cap it off here, I suppose. So to conclude, conservatives hate themselves and you, and they want you to suffer, and also they want themselves to suffer for some weird masochistic reason, uh, and it's not good. However, while I do acknowledge that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, I also find it necessary to look toward the silver lining in a variety of these things, if you can, uh, and try to keep the hope, if you can, a kind of positive nihilism, if you will. Uh, because the fight for civil rights is paved with a variety of people who feel exactly as you do right now, who feel down, who feel beaten, who feel depressed, who feel upset and sad about the future of themselves, their loved ones, their community, their country. Uh, but many of these civil rights fighters in the past did not get to live to see the fruits of their fighting. The civil rights fighters who achieved women's suffrage 
women's right to vote, many of them did not survive to see it themselves. Many of the civil rights fighters who fought to end slavery or segregation for black people did not live to see it themselves. But that doesn't mean you stop fighting. The old saying goes, a wise person plants trees that they know they will never enjoy the shade of. And I think that's how you're going to have to engage with shit. Unless, you know, you're just going to lose your mind in a doomer spiral. You have to, you know, keep hope. That's the way I like to look at things. The hope that I see in the horizon, and of course, the right to unionize is certainly not set in stone and is constantly being attacked, uh, is a lot of these industries, a lot of these places unionizing across the country. It seems like class consciousness is going up. More and more people understand that solidarity between all people, <clears throat> man, woman, poor, queer, black, brown, anything else in between. All of these people standing in solidarity and fighting for the liberation of all of them is the only way that we're possibly going to make it out of this. Many people, as time goes on, are realizing that the way that we've been doing things isn't really working, and a proportional response could be in the works into the future. And the only way we're going to get to that, especially as leftists, is by consistently engaging with all of this shit. An essential but unfortunate part of being a leftist is despair, okay? Frankly. When you become a leftist, when you understand the world for what it is, when that liberal wool is pulled off of your eyes, you really do start to see how fucked everything is and how, like, seemingly hopeless things are. But that's, I think, all the more reason to fight. That's all the more reason to stay engaged and fight for a better future. This is the only one we got. Hope you're doing okay. Hope you're doing well, uh, and I hope that this moment has given you some clarity about the dire situation that all people in this country, unless you're wealthy and white, and a man specifically, the peril that we're all in, and provokes you to act constructively with your local community in order to try to solidify the civil rights, the individual liberty, the bodily autonomy of all of us. You cannot let this moment make you hopeless and make you disengage from this political project, you have to make it radicalize you to want to do more. This video is kind of call it as Nini Nuna. Thanks so much for the support and for being a consistent participant in my Twitch chat. Many are saying this actually makes you one of the coolest people around. If you want to be the Connor Callout, you can follow me on Twitter at ConnorCC and retweet my video links when they go live. Remember to subscribe to the channel, put all notifications on and hit the bell. We appreciate that as well. Leave a like if you'd like, comment something hopeful in the comments because i'm pretty sure this is going on a video that is not so much that and have as good of a day as you possibly can